For people who want to know what is the Key Fangy Network, the whole point of my talk show is to show you that even with having a word of disability, I can style them out to something. And at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of word and disabilities and disabilities to never give up and prove people wrong. Prove to them that labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be. So prove them. Stem out to some. Hi, I'm Leslie Ann Alviston, and I'm a uh, actor, a writer, a teacher, and a director and theatre producer. And I just wanted to say how much I really, really enjoyed talking to kids today. Um, it was great fun. I feel like I've made a new friend for life. Um, and I just want to thank him for choosing me to talk to you today. Thank you, and watch everything he's done. My name is Keith Andrew, and thank you for joining us today. Today, episode number nine of the one and only Keith Andrew Network. Today, our guest is from the United Kingdom, and I just want to say thank you for being us, being with us from across the ocean. Oh, you're more than welcome. It's really nice um, to talk to someone that isn't in this sort of February gloom that we have here in the UK at the moment. The skies are grey, it's cold, it's dark already. So um, maybe you're bringing us a little bit more, uh, I don't know, sunshine or something. No, I agree, absolutely. And now one thing I do want to ch uh, change real fast. It's actually now we're gonna do this bit of video comedy and then in a little bit in a little I like to change it up on the Keith Engine Network. My new video comedy is I have it on split screen. But you okay. know what? It's stupid to have the same thing in every single episode. It's good to be different. So we're gonna take a break in a little bit and the video comedy will change. But it doesn't make a difference. As one as you're enjoying yourself and you're having a good time and you're supporting the message about people with disabilities. First sure. question I want to talk to you about uh -huh. is I'm looking at your profile. You are a writer, director, professional <laughs> actress. Yes. And I think the last one, you are an artist, teaser. Yeah. And I think it's an improper that you are a part of. Yeah. Um after I went to theatre school, I uh, took some uh, comedy improv classes at the Comedy Store in London, and it was a really exciting time. Improv was a new sort of art form, and it sort of fitted in with the alternative cabaret circuit, um, where there was all these new stand-ups coming and being radical, and we thought we were being really cool doing these um, unscripted comedy shows. Um, and uh, it was great fun and I made so many new friends. I'd just come to London and I'd started working with a theatre company for the deaf with um, hard and hearing and deaf actors. Um, and this was just like something else I did as well. And I, it's really addictive because um, you don't have to learn any lines. You just get on stage and make it up and hopefully you're funny. Um, so I've done heaps of that over the years. I've dipped in and out of it, and I also teach it. Um, and it's a really useful craft to teach anyone um, because uh, it's just such good fun. Um, but, yeah, I kind of do lots of different creative things. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's me. No, absolutely. Now, usually I have like a top 15, but we can do that in the second part. But I just want to toss them briefly on the free on the, let's see, one, two, three, on the free top subjects that actually uh, jump out to me. You are actually a professional writer. So the first question I want to ask you is who inspired you to become a professional writer? Um, my favorite novel that I ever read when I was a teenager, it's a classic, it's The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And ever since then, um, I've been inspired by that kind of imagination and um, also going into Star Trek, that was a big influence. 
Um, I'm experimenting with writing some sci-fi sort of screenplay at the moment that has time travel in it. But I think I think that is probably my biggest influence of all the time. I know it's everybody's, but I really, really love that idea that you can just move around, go back, try and fix things, maybe mess it up. Uh, I, yeah, I love sci-fi. You know, it's funny. I'm a big fan of Dragon Ball. And it's funny because they make fun of uh, Back to the Future. Back to the Future, hands down, one of the greatest movies ever. But, Absolutely, yeah. But after you watch the, the Dragon Ball, it's kind of like, well, maybe they're right. Well, well, let me ask you this. What is your opinion? Because in my opinion after watching Dragon Ball, hashtag Dragon Ball, <laughs> it's if you, for an example, there's an episode in the future where your future is being destroyed by androids and the uh -huh. hero who was supposed to help you passed away. So you take a time machine and go back in the past. <laughs> so by giving him the heart virus, the antidote, the antidote for the heart virus, you would think if he went back to the present, he would be around. But uh -huh. going back in time, you're not going back to the same point in time you create an alternative reality. Yeah. Do you think that's how it works? Or do you think it's like back to the future? You go in the past and it changes up in the future. I think you create an alternative timeline, definitely. Um, and uh, it might be one that you're not even in. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I go I go with that. I, li I like that. Um yeah, I'm writing a screenplay at the moment. Are you interested in it? Should I tell you about it? Yeah, absolutely. It's whatever you it's, want to talk about. It's it's got um it's set in the future when we all have our own little cheap time machines, like <laughs> we have our mobile phones, and you have rules and regulations. You can only go back. Um, you can't go back before you were born. Um, you can't do anything that, you know, there's all these sort of rules. But of course, um, the expensive ones um, have special blockers on them. But then people manufacture really cheap ones and they can do anything they like with them, really. And then the world just gets really messed up because everyone is changing their past. So everything is fractured so i should have told you the plot because someone could steal it now and write it and then in a different timeline they'll be successful with it and i won't so well you heard <laughs> it first on the key banjo network yes and it's copyrighted it's, now yeah yep. and no one can take it without my permission and your permission and by the Thank way you. maybe we can do something a project together <laughs> but you know anything you hear on my talk show you have to have the guest's permission and the host's permission before you just randomly okay. take it. But, you know, my sister is also a uh, poetry writer, and oh. she's a big fan of Timeline. And, mm -hmm. you know, Timeline is actually a, a fantastic book. I like the book a lot more than the movie. But let me ask you something, because you are a writer. Do uh -huh. you think the books are always better than the movies, or do you think the movies are better than the books? Um, I think if I've read the book, the movies are always a little bit disappointing. Um, and especially if they make a sequel and it's just a tenuous sort of connection to the original novel. Um, uh, yeah, I find it really difficult to watch a movie when I really, really enjoyed the book really hard and I'm going but they didn't put that bit in it and oh they've added that and that's not right yeah I, I think I think it's it's a real danger that you're going to be disappointed when you see the movie yeah I agree now we're going to take a quick commercial break and when we come back we're going to finish the subject when we come back okay okay now we're back from the quick commercial break and it's really interesting because when I had COVID and that's the next question I want to ask is how has the pandemic impacted your career when I had COVID and I was recovering I have, I was bored and so I besides sleeping what am I supposed to do I actually started to listen to Michael Crampton's Jurassic Park, 
um, oh, this in yeah. Lost World. I think I listened or began to listen to Timeline. I'm not 100% about that, but I may have to listen to it. But let me ask you this. And yes, I talk with my hands, force a habit. How has okay. the pandemic impacted your career? And has it gave you a different point of view on life? Um, yes, obviously, uh, everything changed. Um, a really close friend of mine died of COVID in the early days. Um, she was there one minute and gone the next. Um, so yes, it did. It made me think I'd better just get on and do all the things that I really want to do. And just do them, um, just in case. Um, but one thing that is a good thing about being a creative person is that if you are confined and you have to stay in, um, I mean, I, I was lucky. I had a whole bunch of things that I could do. I could write. I could paint. I'm an artist, so I got all my paintings out. Um, and I wrote a play. I wrote a play about being held um hostage uh, because I was I was locked in with my family and we all got on together but I thought what would it be like if you were um held hostage or you know locked in a lockdown with someone that you didn't like or you didn't know why you were there so I wrote I wrote a one-act play which then I put on last year several times and produced it and it was called chop me up or let me go <laughs> and also everyone was spending so much time on social media because we couldn't go out and do real things. Um, you know, everyone was looking at everyone and stalking each other, and I was looking at all these actors, and I thought, what if, what if somebody actually kidnapped an actor for a really good reason and held them captive for a while? Um, how would that go? Uh, so I got a... I got like an hour long comedy to hand her out of it. And I, I put that on last year with two amazing, uh, really young, really talented actors. Um, and that was a great experience. And I might put it on again. Um, so I got something good out of being locked in my house. <laughs> but not everybody's has that sort of, you know, Thing that they can do lots of people need to work outside and in different environments but it was kind of cool for me no i agree and <laughs> my my brother says once the pan coronavirus vaccine comes out you know you can go back to do whatever you want but the thing is hopefully you will always go back a couple of years you know because this spin around but it died out you know with the bird flu mm -hmm. with uh H one V one or whatever the hell it was, and then it was something else. And luckily, you know, from two thousand three, maybe two thousand four, the pandemic could have happened, but we got lucky. Mm -hmm. But what uh, we're really interested in is a couple of years ago, sitting outside was my dad. He was listening to an audio book called uh, Kachajan. I can't remember who wrote it. Uh -huh. But it was about the pandemic. Yeah. And, and I find it really interesting that how did they enter? So I think, um, I can't think of the author, but he has contacts within the government. So he knew about certain events before they happened. It's like how. Sure. Uh, yeah. If I find the guy's name, I'll let you know. But it's really interesting how he has <laughs> people telling him. This was going to happen. That was going to happen. You know. Please, did they make a movie out of that as well, I'm or a TV series? I've got a feeling they there's a movie called Contagion, which I think, is. I think so. I know there was an audio book. Yeah. yeah, and it's um, yeah, it's really scary. It's like the writers can preempt and foresee these things. We seem to have this, um ability to see into the future but he sounds like he might have had some sort of insider information anyway no absolutely he he has yeah. friends within the government 
Um, I don't remember his name, and I'm not going to put him on the spot, <laughs> but he sure. writes fantastic things. Mm-hmm. But the next question I want to ask you is, have you ever ghostwritten a book, number one, and have you ever written articles about somebody? No, I haven't. I haven't ghostwritten a book. Um, no. And I haven't written articles about anyone either. No, I, I don't think I'm that sort of writer. Um, I would be a ghostwriter for someone if they were going to pay me lots of money, of course. <laughs> yeah. And as long as I would hope that their um, life was interesting or their story, if it was a, a, a biographical thing i hope that they would you know be a, enough interesting content to keep me going but i don't know if i would ghost write um a novel a story for someone because i'd want it to be in my name yeah i Not agree live. yeah <laughs> so the next question i want to ask you is i know it's only 13 minutes but we'll see how far we can go first question okay. i want to ask you you mentioned your writer director and actress. So the first question I want to ask you is, what is the biggest change you want to make in your career? And that's for all three subjects. Um, What was the first subject? Writing? Yes. I really want to have a movie made. I want to write a movie, a science fiction movie, and get it made in Hollywood. Um, That's a big ambition, but I'd really love that. What about... Uh, oh, go ahead. And what was the second one? Oh, directing. Di- directing. I really like to direct a movie or a big play um, in a big theatre somewhere. Um, but mainly a movie. I've always wanted to be a film director. Uh, and I love the fact that my birthday's on the same day as Alfred Hitchcock's. Um, and the resemblance between him and me now. And um, acting. Yeah, I, I do. I would really love to direct a film love to and the other one the acting well i'd um i'd let that go by the wayside for a really long time and i'd almost forgotten that i actually trained as an actor originally i went to art college and then i went to drama school so um i've got a, like a mixture of all those skills and i did get acting work and then i got sidetracked with comedy um and i just suddenly realized i think i want to do some acting again because everyone else in my family are actors. Um, and I thought, hmm, yeah, I'm going to have another go. So I'm putting myself out there again um, and hoping hoping to get some auditions. And, uh, of course, doing self-tapes is like a whole new skill that you've got to learn for actors because nobody seems to go to an actual audition anymore. Um, so that's a whole sort of technological um new thing that I've got to apply myself to, but I like new challenges. No, absolutely. So the next question is all for all three subjects. What are some of your career highlights? Um my career oh I've done all sorts of different things. Um I I wrote a musical uh, a long time ago. I worked as an actor at the Museum of the Moving Image, which isn't in London anymore, Um, but it was a great big thing in the 80s that opened. It was a museum of film and television, and I was one of the first actors there, and I was inspired by the Odeon Cinema uh, foyer that they had a mock-up of there and had to be an usherette and I met another actor there who was a musician and we wrote a full musical called Seats in All Parts and it was all about an old cinema uh, in the north of England and it was like a full musical with singing and dancing and comedy and baddies, nasty um, evil people in it and I uh, we wrote it together um, and I put a production of it on at the Hen and Chicken Theatre in the 90s. Um, and it was a really big success and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then it was put on again in a big art centre in Salisbury. Um, it was like a full musical. 
Um, and that's just sitting on the shelf waiting to go on again. But I just need financing. Um, it just costs a lot of money to put these things on yourself. But I think that was definitely a highlight. I felt extremely proud, but I had the arrogance of youth to just drive me through and go, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and I did it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, the next one I want to add to is you mentioned you're a director and teacher. So mm -hmm. these two are perfect for you. How comfortable are you speaking in front of a group of people? Totally. <laughs> I could get up in front of millions of people and speak. Was, um, was, oh, go ahead. I, um, I grew up in South Wales uh, near the Rhondda Valley. And the, the Welsh schools, well, Wales has a nice Deadford, which is a really lovely big yearly arts festival. And, of course, all the schools have their own little version of it every year. And I learned that I could, um, you had like competitions, house competitions, and I used to get up and do the verse speaking and the choral speaking and do sort of bits of drama and dance dramas. And I, I found then that I could um, just get up and I don't know why, but I've never been nervous in front of an audience. <laughs> yeah. So, so the next one is similar to that. How comfortable are you teaching people and teasing in front of a group of audience um very comfortable um and the older i get um the more skilled i get at um gauging the right level sussing the students out recognizing they've all got different abilities and needs and requirements from the workshop um I'm doing a really interesting job at the moment, which um, really helps people. Um, it's great to apply the skills that I have and, and my colleagues that we have um, so that we can help people. And comedy improvisation isn't just for getting up and being funny. You, you can use it to help people's mental health um, and well-being and relaxation. And, of course, we all know that laughing is um a, a great cure it's a great healer um and you can lose yourself in comedy for a while so i'm working with a project at the moment um working um with uh ex veterans um teaching them comedy improv doing workshops with them and i've i've only been doing it for a few weeks and i'm finding that extremely rewarding um, they seem to love it. They think I'm crazy. Um, and, and they're having a laugh. They're having fun. Um, and obviously, you know, um, if you've been a soldier or worked in the services, then you're going to come away with a little bit of um, mental health issues and PTSD and things like that. So, um it's great. It's um, it's a new project that's being run by the NHS, and um, and it's great to be a part of it. It's just sort of starting up, and in fact, they were even talking about eventually maybe bringing it to the states as well, um, to you guys. Uh, so I'm really really excited about that. No, yeah, I agree. Now I'm going to pass the show over to you. But well, I want to ask you a new subject I want to talk about, news in the world. What is the breaking news over in the UK, number one? And what is your opinion about the Chinese air balloon that we shot down? <laughs> I really don't know. I can't help. News like that always just makes me laugh. And <laughs> I think, here we go again. Um, and I really don't know. Um, yeah, maybe it was just what they said it was. Maybe it was spies. I quite like, I quite like intrigue and um, espionage and stuff like that because I'm a writer and it just excites me. So, <laughs> oh, or you know, my imagination even says maybe it's aliens spying on us. It's um, funny you should mention that, but I, I can. I'll go ahead. I can tell you after. Um, well, just that's it. And the, the breaking news, there's always 
breaking news in the UK about the royal family and all that kind of um, stuff. And I, uh, um, but the, I mean, the main, the main thing is that Zelensky came over and we hosted him. And a, a Ukrainian friend of mine is actually staying with me for a while. Um, she's a student and I invited her, I, I taught her some improv and I invited her to come and live with me. So um, I sat and watched the um, uh, Zelensky's big uh, talk that he gave with all the <laughs> English <laughs> people and uh, I, I did feel slightly embarrassed about being English and our approach and how, how we treat treat people um, with all this formal um, courtesy and the, all the BBC big build up to um, him coming. But it's great. It was wonderful. And it was really nice watching it with my friend on the sofa. I felt really connected to the whole thing and the Ukraine um, crisis that's going on and um, yeah that feels real very real and worrying it was really funny because I saw it on Facebook uh, it's like oh we shot up and down but I was like uh, somewhere <laughs> at a high altitude and it's like it might have been a UFO it's like you know that's the last uh, uh, that's the last thing you need to freaking do piss off the aliens <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, this is what I kept saying during the pandemic I, and the, then the war. And I said, well, logically speaking, um, that's the next thing is that the aliens are going to make contact with us. Everything else is happening. So where are the aliens? Or maybe they just took a one big long look and went, uh-uh. It's like and a joke. <laughs> it's like a joke. Um, the aliens are watching TV. It's like, well, we watch an Earth season nine. The earth is really on fire this year. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And um, yeah, yeah, I I really don't know what it is or what it is, but just shoot it down. If you don't know what it is, shoot it down. Yeah, if a UFO landed, I'd be like, take me. I, I want to go on space adventure. I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm waiting for them to pick me up and take me away. I'll just go. I've got my <laughs> bag ready. Yeah, yeah. But I do have a couple questions for you off the air. Okay. But wrapping up the interview segment, for us to do okay. part two, our goal is to reach 100 views. I will okay. share it on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, all social medias. And once we reach 100 more reviews, definitely stay tuned to part two. But wrapping up our interview segment, it was a real honor and privilege to have me as a guest. And I'm looking forward to part two down the road. So until we meet again, catch you later. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been great fun. Bye-bye. Hey kid